will stand with me as we sing our call to worship this morning. We'll start with hymn number 572, Blessed Assurance. We'll sing the first and the third. Good morning. Man, what do you have to praise God for today? Being in church. Amen. Being together. Uh, take some time this morning as we begin. Just bow with me today. And, and I want you to take some time and, and praise God. Um, praise God for who He is today. Praise God for the blessings of, of your life. And, and ask God to, to speak into your life this morning. Lord, we praise you today for the blessings of life. And we know, Lord, that those blessings come through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That He was willing to give His life up on that old rugged cross. That we might be forgiven and reconciled and have life and have it abundantly and eternally. Lord, I pray that, that we would celebrate the life that You have blessed us with. And, and all the ways that You have blessed us, Lord, are not just materially, Lord, but the ways that you have blessed us spiritually. Thank you, God, for the peace that you give us. And thank you, Lord, for the joy. And, and Lord, thank you for the grace and, and the mercy. And, Lord, thank you so much, God, for, for just the excitement of the little things, Lord, of life that, that, you, that you give us every day. For every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. And we thank you for it and we praise you for it today. And Lord, we pray and we ask, Lord, as, as we gather in your presence today, Lord, that, that your spirit, Lord, would be with us. Lord, that your spirit would move among us. But Lord, that you would speak into our hearts. Lord, that you would speak into our lives. Lord, that we might be drawn closer to you. That we might become more like you. That we might be committed, Lord, to live out the life, Lord, that you have placed within us. Lord, through the presence of your spirit. So, Lord, thank you, Lord, for, for who you are. And, Lord, today, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. And, Lord, may it, may it make a difference, Lord, in us. May we grow in Christ. Lord, may we seek you more every day. And, Lord, may we reflect your life through our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll continue singing with me today, it's 185, the next hymn. Jesus loves me. We'll sing all three verses.
Now for our offertory hymns, it's hymn number 83. We'll sing through it twice. There's something about that name. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for your blessings that you've given to us each and every day to follow. Lord, we just thank you for your word that we've heard, uh, listened to and, and, and studied on this morning, dear Father, in Sunday school, dear Father, Lord, and I pray for this uh, this time together, dear Father, Lord. I pray that you just open our hearts and minds, Lord, to hear your word, dear Father, Lord. Just speak through Brother Chad as he brings a message. Lord, just open our hearts and, Lord, maybe uh, live by you faithfully, dear Father, Lord. Uh, lead, guide, and direct us this upcoming week, dear Father, Lord, and just uh, may we live live faithfully for you, dear Father, Lord. As we come to this time of the service, dear Father, pray that you just be be with the gift that is given and may uh, be uplifted into your kingdom, dear Father, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. I pray, Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Miss Mary. Psalm 139, if you would turn there with me this morning. Psalm 139. Are you happy to be alive? You know, your life uh, is a gift. You are a gift. And, and as we start our message uh, this morning, you are actually the opening illustration. And so if you take your hand and just look at your hand for just a, just a few moments there, you have something that no one else in the world has and the six billion people plus on the planet, you are completely unique. Your fingerprint is like no one else's on the planet. You are uniquely you, created by God. You are given your life, and it is very unique. Did you know that identical twins, although they share the same DNA, that even identical twins do not have the same fingerprints. That of the millions and millions of fingerprints that have been recorded and put on record in the history of the world, there's never been a duplicate. In Psalm 139, verse 13, it says, For you, meaning God, for God, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. By the time you were three months old, I mean, in your mother's womb, for the, three, for the first three months of your life, your fingerprint was forming in the womb. God knit you together in your mother's womb. And the psalmist says, I praise you, I praise you, God, I give you praise. Just as we bowed a little earlier today and we praise God for life and we praise God for the blessings, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you unique. He gave you your life. And the psalmist says, your works are wonderful, Lord. I know that full well. Do you know that today? The value of your life, how fearfully and wonderfully you were crafted by God. He gave you your life. It is a gift. It is a blessing from God. And therefore, the value of your life, your worth, comes from your Creator, the eternal God. He is the one who created you, he's the one who loved you, he's the one who provided salvation for you, and he is the one that gives us value and purpose in life. Now, January the 22nd, coming up this Saturday, uh, we'll celebrate the National Sanctity of Human Life. Now, that particular day was set aside. It originated by President Ronald Reagan in 1984. 11 years after the infamous Roe v. Wade 1973 court decision that legalized abortion. Now, Ronald Reagan was a very strong pro-life president and he set aside this national day. He opposed this law uh, very strongly and, and he set aside this national day to emphasize the value of every life, born and unborn. And we stand as churches of many different denominations, as Christian churches, we stand every year to emphasize and support the sanctity of human life. Because as a Christian, as a church, we value life from the womb to the tomb, all the way. Although the issue of abortion is at front and center, during sanctity of human life. And, and you know, you ask, you know, well, well why, why do we support this day? Why do we emphasize it at least once a year? Well, let me give you a, a few statistics here. Now, these are a little older statistics uh, from 2017. 
But the number of abortions in the U.S. in 2017 was 862,320. Abortions per day were 2,362. Abortions per hour were over 98. And that basically boils down to one abortion every 96 seconds in the United States. And that's a little older statistic, 2000. And 17. And so you think about those staggering numbers, and when we think about that, we realize, you know, hey, as, as churches, as Christians, you know, we need to stand up. We need to value life as well. But the sanctity of human life doesn't just address the abortion of is, uh, uh, abortion as the issue, it addresses all issues that are related to evil and injustice from violence to abuse to human trafficking, even to forced labor. And let me give you a few statistics on those issues. Our national issues are 16 million people that are trafficked for forced labor in the private economy. There's 4.8 million people trafficked for sexual exploitation. And of course, women and girls are disproportionately affected by human trafficking, about 71% of all victims. When you come to domestic violence, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. During one year, that equates to 10 million men and women. One in four women and one in four men have been victims of severe physical violence, such as burning or beating or strangling by an intimate partner in their lifetime. One in ten women have been raped by an intimate partner in their lifetime. On a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. One in five women and one in 71 men has been raped in their lifetime. Almost half of females, 46.7%, and males, 44.9% of rape in the United States is by an acquaintance or someone that they know. When it comes to the effect on children, one in 15 children are exposed to an intimate partner of violence each year, and 90% of these children are eyewitnesses to that violence. When it comes to child abuse and neglect, the United States has one of the worst records among industrialized nations, losing an average of five children every day to child abuse and neglect. In, 19, in 2019 alone, state agencies found 656,000 victims of child maltreatment. That would pack 10 modern football stadiums. You know, so when you think about those numbers, and I believe the numbers on, on abortion now are like 60 65 million and something. I believe it was on our little flyer that we had from the uh, pregnancy center. About 65 million abortions. You know, we think about uh, 4.8 million people trafficked for sexual exploitation. Um, think about that in, in this sense. 65 million abortions over this period of time. Um, 4.8 8 million people trafficked for sexual exploitation. Kind of put those numbers in perspective. The, the whole population of the state of Mississippi is 2.9 million for the whole state of Mississippi. And so that, that gives you a little idea of the issue that, that's staggering and you could also even say overwhelming. So, you know, when you think about these issues, whether it's the issue of abortion or whether it's the issue of, of violence or, or trafficking or whatever that it might be, we have responsibility as a church 
to, to partner with, with people, to partner with ministries, to, to do our part for the sanctity of human life. To speak out, to share the gospel, because the gospel at its heart, the very core of the gospel is about life. That's what it's about. The life that God has given a person, the life that God intends a person to have, and, and the life that that God desires everyone to have, which is eternal life in Him. So as Christians and as a church, as we think about our responsibility as individuals, as a believer, our responsibility is to grow in Christ to a certain point to where, to where our views and to where our beliefs in, are in line with the Word of God. And once our views and our beliefs are in line with the Word of God, then we're able to live out the will of God in our life, and we're able to make a difference with the life that God has given us. And so, how do we go about doing that? How do we go about valuing life the way God values life, so that we live in such a way that that life the life of God flows through us and makes a difference in the lives of others around us. So there's three things I want to mention to you about that this morning. And the first is this. If we're going to value, the way, value life the way God does, we've got to celebrate life. We've got to celebrate life. We've got to be about life. We have to celebrate the life that God has given, not just the life He's given us, but the life He's given to others as well. Now, in Genesis chapter 1, we all know that particular uh, passage of Scripture that God has created all things, that everything in creation bears the fingerprint of God. In Romans 1.20, it says that through creation, man should be able to see the Creator because the creation bears witness to the Creator. And so as, as I ask you to look at your fingerprints earlier, as I ask you to consider your life, you bear witness. You are a walking billboard for the Creator. And humanity, mankind, created in the image of God, Genesis 1.21, let us make man in our image. That is uniquely set apart humanity from the rest of creation. And that's where your value comes from. That's where the value of every person, the 6 billion plus people on the planet, their worth and value comes from the fact that God has made us in His own image. Therefore, everybody has value and worth because everybody is fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Now, the gospel and the word of God teaches us that, that it is man's sin which has marred this image and has separated us from God. And it is our sin that has brought brokenness into our world and, and death into our world. But in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus says the gospel is about life. I am about life. I am about reconciling man to God and giving man the life, renewing and restoring the image of God within a person and giving them the life that God intended them to have abundantly and eternally. And you know, that's what God is doing in your life as a Christian. God is renewing His image through your relationship with Jesus because Jesus is that perfect man, that perfect image of God. And so as you grow in Christ, you grow in that image of God because you have the life of God in you and you're able to experience the blessings of God and the life of God and you look forward to that eternal life as well. And you see Jesus being about life he valued each and every person. When you read the gospel, it, it's, it's astonishing to see just how different Jesus was from the religious culture, the culture around him, how different he viewed people. He was willing to spend time with the sinners and the outcast. He was willing to forgive the sinful. He was willing to heal the sick, to touch the outcast, to touch the people nobody else would. And you know, when I think about that, I think about a story 
an encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 13. And it says there that on the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And there was a woman there who was crippled by spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. So if you think about this lady in this church service with Jesus, she had this spirit. And the spirit had had literally bent her back so that she was completely crippled. She could not stand up at all. And all of her days were spent looking around the ground, walking around, having to hold her head up just to see someone that, that would talk to her. Can you imagine that, that suffering, 18 years? Not just a physical, but it says a spirit. So that, that has to do with mentally, emotionally, Spiritually, how disconnected, how outcast she must have felt because of what she was going through. 18 years, and she was here in this synagogue. So that tells us that this lady, this was the community synagogue, and so she frequented this synagogue for 18 years. People looked at her and judged her. Something's wrong with her. God has cursed her. Nobody... I'm sure spoke into her life, reached out to her. God had cursed her. She was outcast. Then here comes Jesus. And he sees her differently than everybody else in that synagogue. He sees the value of her life. Celebrates who she is. And look what happens. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and he said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. You see, that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is about life. The gospel is about freedom and forgiveness. The gospel is about celebrating the value of a person created in the image of God, renewed and restored in His image. Then he put his hands on her, the very person that nobody would touch. He placed his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up, and catch this, she praised God. Wow. And that's why every time that we walk in church together, we need to be praising God. When we show up in Sunday school, we need to give God praise. We need to have something to praise God for every time we come to church. And when we show up in Sunday school and church and somebody says, hey, what do you got to praise God for? What are you thankful for? I don't know. Man, when we show up together in the church house, we need to bring our praises with us to God's house. Because every single one of us that's saved has been bent over by the sin of this world and we've been set free by a Savior who loves us. And we need to be celebrating the life that God has given us. Not only us, but celebrating it in the gospel. So challenge yourself to praise God more for what He's done for you. She set up, she praised God, but then look what happened. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, Well, hey, there are six days for work. Don't you love the religious folks? There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. This woman had money through Saturday to show, to show up to Jesus and get healed. Why she got to come on Sunday? Right? Interrupt our church service. Do something different in church. Isn't it something how religious people get upset when God shows up in church? Because, see, oftentimes religious people don't have a relationship with God because they only trust their religion to save them and not God. The Lord answered and he said, you hypocrites. And then this is what I want you to see right here. The Lord said, you hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath. So you got exceptions for your own religious rules. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out and give it water. Then should not this woman, you hear that? This woman, this one that that I value life in. 
This woman, a daughter of Abraham, this woman who God created, this woman who's a child of God, should she not be set free on the Sabbath day from the spirit that has bound her by Satan for 18 years? Should she not be celebrated? Should she not be loved? Should she not receive grace? Should she not be changed by the life that God has? You see how Jesus valued life. And what I want you to see here is how the religious people in their camps, and isn't that what the political environment is about today? I mean, people get in their little camps, and man, they can't see anything else but their own political perspective and their own opinion and what they think it ought to be like and this and that and the other. We don't need political opinions. We need Jesus. And we need to see people the way Jesus sees people, not in political parties or political camps. Jesus celebrated life and he saw the value of life in this woman and he set her free by the power of the gospel. And that's the perspective that you and I, as followers of Jesus, should have. The second thing I want you to see is this. Not only should... We celebrate life and value life. But you and I have a responsibility to speak life. To speak life. Words of life. And I want us to understand this very well. And I want our young people down here that hadn't... Yeah, they're all looking at me, man. How y'all do? Don't you love them sitting at the front? I try not to spit too much, but... I want y'all to understand this very well too. The words you say are powerful. And we don't realize that at times. I remember when I, I, I know I've told you this before in the past, but I remember uh, playing basketball, Park Lane in the 10th grade. And we had a young coach there, and he was an assistant coach. He coached the JV team. And, of course, you know he was, uh, you know how young coaches are, right? We ain't got any coaches in here, do we? <laughs> no. So, he, you know, he's flexing his muscles. But I, I remember as a young kid, you know, I was already kind of scared to death on the basketball court, a little insecure and, and all of this. And I remember him in one practice yelling at me, Yarber, you do the dumbest things I've ever seen on a basketball court. Now, that coach, I'm sure he, he probably don't even remember he coached me. And I know, he, I know he don't remember that. He probably yelled at a lot of kids through, through his career by now. And he probably doesn't remember anything he said. Don't even remember the incident. But for me, being an insecure 10th grader already, I still remember it. Why? Because words are powerful. Negative words, but also positive words are powerful. They affect people. They stick with people. In James chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, the Bible puts it this way. The Bible says, Look at the ships. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue, a small member, yet it boasts great things. So what is the Bible saying? That your tongue has the power of influence, negative or positive, based on your will. And so what you say matters. What you say to your children, what you say to your parents, what you say to your brothers and sisters, what you say to your friends, what you say to other people around you, it matters. It has an influence. And so therefore, we need to be very careful of what we say and how we say it because Jesus said that on the day of judgment... 
We're going to give an account for every careless word we've uttered from our mouths. And why are we going to do that? Because your words have influence. They have power over people's lives. Things you say stick with people, negative or positively. So how are we to speak life to people? There's three things I want to say to you about that. If we speak life to people, we have to speak in line with the truth of the gospel. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore, the things that we say should line up with the truth of the gospel. It should line up with the truth of God's word. If you love somebody, if you care about them, if you value them, you will tell them the what? You will tell someone the truth, whether, whether they want to hear it or not, whether it's night, whether it's pleasant to hear or not, you will speak truth to people. You will tell them the truth based on God's word and lining up with the truth of the gospel. But how else are we to do that? When you look at Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about how a Christian is to live their life and he emphasizes the things that we say. And he does that because, as we talked earlier, words are powerful. And so in chapter 4, verse 15, Paul says that as Christians within the church, within the community, that we are to speak truth to people, but we are to be speaking truth in love. And so what we have to ask ourselves continually is, am I speaking in love? Is my motivation for what I say, is that love? Am I valuing this person? Am I loving this person? And if what I'm not saying is not in love, then we need to keep our mouth shut. Because you can speak the truth and you can do it to hurt somebody. And if you do it with the motivation to hurt somebody, speaking in truth can be a sin. Based on the motivation of your heart. That's why Paul says, speak the truth and speak it how? In love, it's your responsibility. So to speak life, we must speak the truth of the gospel. We must speak the truth of the gospel in love. And then the third thing is this, that we speak truth aimed at building up someone. Speaking, in the, truth, speaking the truth in love means that if I love you, I'll, I want what's best for you. I want what's best in your life. I want what's good for you. So therefore, Paul says, going on in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, speak the truth in love. He gets down to verse 29 and he says this, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Guard your tongue. He said, instead, only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear it. Did you catch that? So if we're going to speak life to people, people who, who, who are struggling, people who are going through things, or, or people that are dealing with something, if we're going to speak life, that means that we speak in, the, in line with the truth of the gospel, we speak in love, and we speak with the goal, with the aim of building up someone and sharing grace with them. So therefore, we think before we speak. Is what I say, is it line up with the truth of God's word? Am I speaking out of love? Am I highlighting and am pushing grace? So let your words be influenced by Christ, by His truth, by His love, by His grace in your life, and therefore speak life and influence someone else for Christ. The third thing is this. Not only do we need to celebrate life and, and speak life, but we need to share life. We need to share life. And aren't you glad that God shared His life with you? The Bible tells us the truth. We are sinners separated from God. It's not good to hear, but it's the truth. That's the heart of our problem. But we hear that truth in love, for God so loved the world. The world, every single person, the individual, 
marked uniquely by their little fingerprints that were formed in their womb before they were ever born. Every single person, for God so loved the world, He shared His life. He gave His Son. That whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus said that that life is abundant. And it starts the moment a person accepts Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, we should see people differently. We should challenge ourselves because we all have, I mean, if we're honest, part of our sinful nature is we all have our, our opinions, we all have our prejudices, we all have our um, preferences, we all have our way of looking at other people, right? We do. And to let God transform us is to let His Word penetrate our hearts and change our perceptions of other people so that we come to the point that we strive to see other people the way Jesus sees them. What if everyone that we looked at, we saw them with the label for one whom Jesus died? What if you looked at people with that perspective? So if we're going to share life with people, with those from whom Jesus died, how do we do that? Well, there's three things I want to mention to you about that. If we're going to share life with people, that begins with praying earnestly. Praying earnestly. Issues that, that we talked about earlier, whether it's issues of abortion that, that uh, people struggle with or deal with, or the larger cultural perspective of it, well, that begins with Christians praying earnestly for people and for those issues. The Bible says in James 5.17 that the effective Fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. In other words, the prayer of God's people is powerful. And so issues that, that seem so overwhelming individually or in our culture, if we share life with people, if we share life in our culture, it begins with praying earnestly for people and problems and for the power of God to work. But it also involves us giving generously. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 8, it says that the person who sows generously will reap generously. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you so that you may abound in every good work. The principle of God's kingdom is that you reap what you sow. And so if you sow, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow more love, you're going to reap more love in your life. If you sow more kindness, you're going to reap more kindness. If you sow more investment in, in, the, in, in the gospel, you're going to reap more benefits from the gospel. So what you sow is what you reap. And the Bible says as you sow generously in your life, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you may abound in every good work, whatever that is that God calls you to. So as you share life, it begins with praying earnestly, but it also begins of giving, it also includes giving of yourself generously and seeing your life as a way of sowing seeds so that God's kingdom can grow. The third thing is this: not only do we pray earnestly and give generously, but we do good where we have opportunity. You see, as we have opportunity, opportunities that God gives us. In Galatians 6.10, it says, As we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all people. All people. So what does that mean for you as an individual, for us as a church? That means as God gives us opportunities, we get involved. When God gives us opportunities, we get involved. That's why we take up love offerings. That's why we support the ministries that we support uh, at Friendship. That's why... We don't need to be content with just 
the love offerings that we take up and some of the ministries that we support, but we need to be constantly looking for the opportunities that God gives us to support more ministries, more opportunities. Every year we, we support through the baby bottle boomerang and other things, the, the Center for Pregnancy Choices of Lawrence County. They do a great work. Last year uh, we had folks from our church that went and, done, went and did some volunteer work there at the center. And they do a great job. SWAT Ministries, which this past year, uh, our budget committee decided that we're putting so much money every month for SWAT Ministries, Heritage Hills, other ministries that, that we did. We supported Hands and Feet Ministry through Vacation Bible School last year. All of these are opportunities for us to share life, to fulfill our responsibility. For God calls some people to be on the front lines. He calls some people and He equips them to be able to fight court battles over abortion issues. He calls some people to organize and, and direct ministries that, that make a difference on the front lines, the people that uh, are over Lawrence County Pregnancy Center and many others. But he calls us all to be a part of sharing life at whatever level that that is. Whether it's on the front lines or whether it's on the backstage through praying and giving. But we share life when we pray earnestly, we give generously, and we do good at the opportunities that God gives us. I wanted to share this because I was impressed with this in our handout. Speaking of praying, and, and it's definitely something that we are going to do uh, for this as we close today. This is from Mississippi Attorney General Lynn Finch. And they've been battling in court. You know Mississippi was front and center here uh, last year on the abortion issue and in the positive direction. Well, it was a big deal. Everybody was watching this case very, um, very closely. And it <clears throat> the case make sure I get the words right, is the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, and it's waiting a court decision at this time. But I wanted to read to you the, the uh, statement from Mississippi Attorney General who's leading the fight, uh, Lynn Finch. I'm so grateful for the prayers and support of pro-lifers across the nation. You have lifted my team and I up as we prepared for and made the argument to the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade. If we are successful, we will have a new opportunity to come together to defend the dignity of women and their children. Our work is far from done. As we await the court's decision, uh, which should come by June the 22nd, please continue to pray that the justices' hearts and minds remain open to the arguments we made before them on December the 1st. And please continue and grow your ministry to women and children in need. Mississippi Attorney General Lynn Finch. So I shared that with you just to emphasize that God has placed his people from the front lines to the pews of the church to celebrate life, to speak life, and to share life because the gospel is about life. And so today as, as we close, I want you to think about this. As the psalmist said, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know this very well. Do you know that your unique mark on your fingerprints I can go to your vehicle, I can go to your house, I can go to your pew where you're sitting, and you've left that mark. If you committed a crime, they'll dust that fingertip and they'll find out it's you. They'll come get you, right? But you have left your mark this morning. You've left it at your house, you left it in your car, you've left it at the church, because wherever you touch... You leave that fingerprint. It's uniquely yours. 
So what fingerprints, what imprints are we going to leave for Christ? What difference are you going to make for Christ? And you will make that difference when you celebrate life, when you speak life, and when you share life, the opportunities God gives you. Let's pray together and we're going to close this morning and before we have our invitation and we're going to pray for these issues. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would and and let's pray for these matters. Lord, I want to thank you so much for the life that you give us through the gospel. Lord, you have forgiven us, you give us freedom, and you give us life abundantly and eternally. You change our identity because you value us and you love us. And you have spoken your living word into us. And we thank you for the life that you've given us, that you created us and that you saved us. And Lord, you sustain us and you secure us for all eternity. But Lord, you also call us. You call us in turn, Lord, to celebrate life and to speak life and to share life through our lives. Lord, today we we pray, Lord, our, our culture, our country, our world, Lord, is so gripped and bound by evil. Lord, we know that just statistics give us ideas of just how pervasive evil and injustice is and how the enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying in our state, in our country, and all over our world. But Lord, statistics are individuals who are hurting. And Lord, we pray for this issue of abortion in our country, this great evil. And Lord, we pray, Lord, for this court decision that's coming up that that our judges would be guided by your hand, by your wisdom. And God, we pray for the overturning of Roe v. Wade and we pray for that with Christians all over our country. That our country, Lord, would stand for life and protecting the unborn. And Lord, I thank you for, for men and women who are on the front lines. Lord, not only of pro-life and, and fighting against abortion, but Lord, that those that are on the front lines and adoption agencies, Lord, in, in reaching out to domestic violence victims and to human trafficking victims, Lord, there are people all over our country that you have put in place, Lord, to to fight these issues on the front lines. And Lord, I pray for us as a church, Lord, to, to see the opportunities to support the ministries, to pray and to give and to go where you call us. Lord, that we might be a church that shines bright for the sanctity of human life. And Lord, today as... We have our closing time of our service and our invitation. As you speak to our hearts, Lord, may we respond in faith. Lord, if there's one here today that needs to receive you as their Lord and Savior and and come from death to life, I pray, God, that they would have the faith, Lord, to come and to profess you and to surrender their life to you. Lord, as Christians, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to, to come to that point of repentance and rededication so that we live a life that is seeking you and surrendered to you, Lord, on a daily basis so that we can see our world the way you see it. We can serve you faithfully and we can share life and the gospel with others. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.